Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Balancing Cloud Costs and Business Goals with FinApps. My name is Andrei Burlutsky. I will be a moderator of today's event. And today we will talk about DevOps, FinOps from technological and business points of view. Our webinar is scheduled for one and a half hour and will be recorded it will be sent to you by email and uploaded to Prophecy YouTube channel. So you won't miss anything. If you would like to share with your team, with your colleagues, or have a look after the event is ended. Um, short introduction to who we are. We are working under the Prophecy brand. From 2015, Prophecy is a DevOps services boutique company in Israel. And Prophecy Labs, our product company with its flagman FinOps product, Unisky, to manage and reduce cloud, uh, public cloud costs in the multi cloud environment based on FinOps framework. We have a solid um, hands on experience connected with our global presence of our teams, of our customers, and of course, projects. We are AWS or Amazon partner and a FinOps Foundation member. FinOps Foundation is a part of Linux Foundation. So we have actually membership of Linux Foundation and also FinOps Foundation. Uh, and now we are sharing our experience and learning that we have in uh, DevOps and FinOps topics. And I'm very, very happy to introduce our guru speakers today. It's Anton Grishko, Chief DevOps Architect at Prophecy Labs and our product Unisky. Hello, Anton. Good to see you. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Nice to be here. Thank you. We are happy to have you. Uh, Stas Klenkin, Senior Solution Architect and DevOps Manager at Prophecy. Hello, Stas, and welcome to our event. Oh, good evening. Thanks. Hello, Stas. And uh, Sergei Plesovsky, Tech Lead DevOps Engineer at Prophecy. Hi, Sergei. As always, pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, hello, colleagues. So let me uh, introduce our short agenda for today. So we like have to uh, plan to have uh, two short presentations today. This is the first one. Following, we're going to have an interactive discussion with questions from you. And the most interactive part uh, of our event is a prize draw of FinOps certification voucher. So it will be a voucher that you can use in order to pass an exam uh, of, uh, on FinOps website to get a FinOps uh, certification. So please ask your question in the chat window. Uh, anytime you have a question to our speaker, I will be monitoring it and ask the question as soon as it will be erased uh, and it will be time during the presentation to answer it. Or otherwise, if the question will be very much related and uh, applicable for the end of the webinar, so I will ask them at the very end. So don't miss our prize draw. It will be right after our panel uh, discussion. And if you have any question to our speakers, please uh, welcome to ask them uh, in the chat window as soon as you as soon as you have it well and we are ready to actually to start so i have a short introduction into our conversation today uh, a small keynote if you want so recently in austin state texas there was a conference on finops it was in uh, back in may or june this year it was very well described and demonstrated uh, the uh, how in parallel FinOps direction is developing and how the, the race of the spendings on public cloud is happening right now. Everything started in 2013 when we were buying software on premise. I think you, many of you or all of you remember those uh, times and were building the infrastructure on the, on the premise and all the spendings were on capital expenses of the company. After that, like it happens usually in the, on the Bay Area in the United States, 
Such companies like Adobe, Atlassian, Airbnb started to moving or started transition to the cloud, started developing their own cloud products. And just in 2016, during the one of Amazon conferences or summits, it was announced a new term, FinOps or financial operations. Already in 2019, there was a book released by Aureli, Aureli Cloud FinOps book, which was recommended to me personally by Anton Grishko, who will be speaking today. We, in this book is really clearly in details is describing the industry or the subject FinOps, its tasks and its methods. By the way, in 2000, so this year, uh, we are expecting the second release of this book. So if you are in this topic and you are, if you are here, uh, don't uh, miss a chance to purchase it. I think it will be distributed on amazon.com. In the same 2019, Gartner is forecasting the growth of cloud spendings by 360 billion in 2022, so this year. Just remember these, uh, these numbers, 2022, uh, 360, uh, 360 million dollars, billion dollars. In 2020, a new foundation of FinOps appears that becomes now a part of Linux Foundation, and actually Prophecy is a part of Linux Foundation as well. In 2022, the number you see on the slide, the number of, uh, of members of Linux or of uh, Phoenix Foundation is growing dramatically up to 7,000 people. And this is like very big amount. And also have a look, the total spendings already in this year for public cloud already half of a billion. And this is a big, big, uh, it, oh, 500 billion, sorry. And this is like a very huge gap actually between what Gartner forecasted, $360 billion, and right now it's $500 billion. So it's almost twice or one and a half. Exactly because of this reason, because the cloud spending growth is going dramatically high, I would say, we are doing today's event, today's webinar. Because both directions, both areas like spendings and FinOps as a direction or subject are growing. Transfer or transition to the public cloud and spendings and the growth of a number of specialists in the FinOps area is actually growing. And right now, FinOps role itself can be both uh, separate or can be joined or connected to the DevOps role, whether it's engineer or manager. And I think we'll be able to ask our guys, our speakers today about these uh, correlations. And even more, even it can be a CTO or architect in the company. So by 2025, Gartner is forecasting more than $1.5 trillion spent to the public cloud globally, of course, globally. It means that it will be three times more and the market will respond. I mean, the amount of job roles, the amount of requirements, the amount of the, the maturity of the framework, etc. So it means actually for us, for engineers, that we need to optimize our cloud architecture. And this demand to optimize will also grow because the amount of cloud is also growing. Mm, the need to decrease will grow. I mean, the need to optimize will grow. The more you grow, the more you need to find the ways to optimize your spendings, how the adoption, the usage, how you use this or that uh, resources or instances. So, and how this will impact to the request to the markets on FinOps specialists. So it will definitely grow. And I think three times in the next three years. And it's actually interesting to see as an example of how the amount of, what's, let's say, job roles is growing, for example, in the UK. 
I took UK example because the United Kingdom is one of these countries where technology adoption is very high, together with the United States, for example, and other big, 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 uh, big companies. And actually, there is some correlation between how the spendings on the public cloud are growing and how, in parallel, FinOps industry is developing. So this is the example of uh, from the Great Britain in terms of job roles. But let's look on the LinkedIn, for example. How what, what's going there? If you will Google, I wanted to say Google. If you will search in the LinkedIn on LinkedIn, uh, how many people identify themselves with the FinOps during the last three two three years? This amount of people has grown as well. So this is showing just additional, I would say, signs that the industry is growing very fast, despite it is very new, very fresh, very, uh, very, very young. Um, but as always, for any industry that we have, there is a, there are challenges, there are trends, etc. Uh, there are several research is made by FinOps Foundation, also by Statista. And actually this data on the screen, I took from a Statista website. And also it was used by FinOps Foundation during the conference in Texas. Have a look. Uh, there are uh, certain expectations and challenges in FinOps direction in cloud public cloud management. Already two years and a half in a row, uh, the first and the main important challenge or request from DevOps community or CTO community, so from those who are connected to the FinOps, is to have, let's say, uh, the tools, frameworks, um, applications, platforms, where they can not only see the uh, analytics, but they also can make a quick decision and make an action. Let's say to see the dashboard, to see the insight, the information, make a conclusion, and immediately to take the action, just clicking the button or uh, in order to um, clean waste or right size uh, instances or uh, spot or make a purchase of the uh, savings plans or reserved instances, anything. But from one place, and it should be quick because the amount of cloud or infrastructure you have to manage or you should manage is also growing. And this is very like interesting because we are talking about acting right here, right now. This is the, the request from, I would say, from uh, engineers that have been um, questioned during this research. That's why taking all together, taking all together, uh, we decided to discuss this question, and I would like to invite Anton Grishko to talk about the approach, how we actually can balance between uh, business goals and FinOps and cloud optimization spending, uh, cloud spending optimization, when we're talking about business, FinOps, and of course, goals and public cloud. So Anton, I again welcome you to the to the stage. Please unmute yourself, and we are ready to listen to your extremely exciting presentation. Yeah, thank you, Andre, and um, nice to see everyone on this uh, conference or meetup. Uh, yeah, let's discuss this quite complex topic: uh, how to balance the cloud costs uh, with the business goals. Basically. Um, how to achieve um, the business goals with the minimal amount of money uh, without overspending it. Um, and the answer is actually really complex. And I will start with the, with the, with the basics. And uh, probably some of you already recognize this diagram. Maybe you don't know what it is. But a long time ago, before the clouds actually were invented, we were doing the, uh, doing the infrastructure on top of our own uh, servers. So we had the data centers, at least some companies still have uh, uh, data centers. And how were we doing managing the infrastructure? We had a set of um, practices, which is called the IT infrastructure uh, library, 
uh, which is someone call it uh, ITIL or ITIL, uh, doesn't matter. It's basically a couple of a uh, couple of books which describes um, uh, describes uh, how to manage the the IT, how to manage the infrastructure, uh, and so on and so on. And you, as you see, based on this uh, diagram, like long time ago, how we're doing that, we had like a first cycle, which is called the management and planning. And this is the, the phase when you are discussing uh, the architecture, you're thinking about how much of infrastructure you need in order to, to put the, this architecture on top of your infrastructure. And this is the place um, in a time where you are actually buying your hardware. You're buying your hardware and you know how much you will pay at least in the, in the beginning. And you're putting some amount of, of, of money for that. Then we have the configuration identification. Then we have the configuration control, which is more about the configuration and taking care about it. And then we have the status accounting and reporting, which is basically accounting and reporting, which is calculating how much you already spent. Take a look if you if you spend it enough, or maybe you need to add something, or maybe you overspend it, and so on, so on. And the last step, which is the verification and audit, basically to audit everything, to write down everything, like, and it's a constant loop. Then you're going back to the to the management and planning, and then you're repeating this process over and over. And this is how we're doing it. So what changed when we go to clouds? When we go to clouds, basically the first the first part, which is management and planning it become very, very um, complex. Why complex? Because like previously how it was done, you had the IT team and this IT team is thinking about what kind of infrastructure you need to get. And then you're, you're writing down the specifications going to, to your financial department and financial department is taking care about buying that, that infrastructure. So you basically have a financial department who's responsible to get you the the hardware and they know how much of the money they will pay. In the cloud, it's a totally different story, right? You're going to a cloud, you can create today five servers, tomorrow you can have a 1,000 servers and you don't have a financial, financial department who is in control of your spendings. Now the spendings is on top of you. And uh, another problem is that um, you can basically do the planning and management at the beginning of the project uh, but it's only a starting point. Why it's only a starting point? That in, in one month after the start, you could have a total different setup. Um, it can be much more larger, or you can even change your architecture. And this is the disjoint, disjoint with the financial department and with the, with the financial part. Let's go to the next slide. And how to solve those issues? Like the first thing that you need to do, you need to make sure what kind of resources you have. How to do that? One of the ways to do that, introduce the tags or tagging to your solution. Doesn't matter what cloud you're using, uh, each and every cloud has a tags. So first of all, that, uh, first thing that you need to do, you need to figure out the tagging structure within your company. I will give you an example. So for example, I have, I have a tags for, for a teams. It could be like a tag for a team A, team B, team C. Uh, um, team A could be working on a project A, project B, and project A, project B could be a part of some, some application A, B, C, D. And in that case, I will put the tags on top of my resources, and then I will be able to filter to find out um, what resources are related to team B, to project A, um, and so on, so on, or to product, product uh, D, whatever. Then the second part, um, basically adding um, technical tags, adding the security tags, and adding the cost tags. Cost tags, which will give you idea about the, the cost uh, unit, um, or maybe even about the price, whatever is related to your, to your uh, cost solution, whatever you want. Amazon even has the recommendations about the, adding the AWS uh, uh, cost allocation tax. This is how they actually call it. You, you can even Google it and find out on the documentation. It's called the cost allocation tax. And basically they're saying that this is the structure that you can use. You can have a business technical security security tax. And also I'm giving on this sli a slide another, another example of how you basically can arrange your tagging solution. But you can put total cost. You can put who is the owner, what's the stack, 
was the cost center, what the was the application name. So this is the first step. Now you have a text. Now you can find out who owns what, how much it costs, and you can do the infrastructure review uh, or infrastructure analysis. This is the first part. Let's talk about the second one. Second part. Now when you have you have text, you know who is responsible for what, you can start collecting all of that together. So you can start building the monitoring tools and you can start collecting, collecting as much as possible data about those resources. So you can build your, uh, on my example, I'm just showing the dashboard from Grafana, which is the monitoring, uh, uh, monitoring tool. And, but in your case, you can, build, you can use any monitoring tool and there are even a special monitoring tools which, are, which were designed for uh, grabbing the financial data from the clouds. But the idea is very simple. You need to collect all that information about all of your resources, who's, who's, who owns the resources, what amount of money you're paying for those resources, how much you're spending for ABCD and so on and so on. As much of data you will collect, it will be much more better for you in, in future. So this part is about collecting metrics and you need to have more metrics. Um, I will give an example from, uh, from real life. I was working for one company. It was, uh, it's, a, it's a big betting company and um, they were trying to achieve, basically they were trying to calculate how much it costs for them one user. So how much for them costs one request? Not in the request, one actual user. What's the price of infrastructure for one user? And it was very complicated to, to calculate because you need to, you need to exclude uh, exclude other costs and you need to collect only this one one user cost you need to find out how much of cpu or memory you're spending for this one one specific re request or user and without collecting very detailed metrics it wasn't what wasn't even possible to do and this is just one example example of such like kpi or metric uh, that you can introduce within your company that's the, the second part now let's talk about the third part FinOps. Um, Andre already mentioned that there is a there is a FinOps, FinOps foundation. It's a FinOps.org. Uh, this is their website, and we are part of this foundation. And what that foundation is saying? That foundation is saying that, hey, you know what? You should introduce a culture or practices within your company, um, and this culture should be should be focused on spending less money on the cloud or spending wisely. Like you can spend a lot of money but you should be paying only for what you're using and only for what you need. And it's very interesting concept. We'll talk about it. And what they're saying that basically there are three main, main um, uh, practices or three main um, uh, like things that you can do. The first practice they call inform. Basically inform is collecting the data, is doing the review, uh, collecting the metrics, is doing the review of your if your infrastructure is detecting anom uh, an anomalies, it's doing the forecasting of your budget, doing the budgeting. So basically, inform part is more advanced management and planning from all old, old days when we're doing the um, um, IT infrastructure uh, library. So we're doing the that like old old management and planning. So instead of management and planning, now we have inform. We, we can do the forecasting, we can, we can track the anom uh, anomaly detection, we can, uh, we can do the reviews of our infrastructure. So at least, at least already we are in hand of situation. Now we, we can go back to our CTO or to CEO and we can say that, you know what, for the like next six months is probably that this is the amount of money which we will spend on, on our infrastructure, on our cloud. The second part is optimize. So when you knowing how much you're spending, where you're spending, what's you going to be, what's your forecast is going to be, the next phase is basically how can I reduce it? What can I do in order to make it to make it more efficient, like paying less? And it's like it's very interesting because you have multiple options that could be like I can okay maybe I'm uh, I choose like two big instances and I can resize them. Or maybe I can change the architecture. For example, I'm using the, 
the Kubernetes cluster instead of Kubernetes cluster partially like part of my workloads I can go to the serverless I can use lambdas functions and so on or maybe for example I'm using the the web server and for web server I'm using the nginx or apache and instead of that I can use the s3 bucket for example and I will be paying less so that kind of optimization you can think about but also optim optimization includes the reservations that for example I know that I will be paying for this database I will be using this database for a year and I'm not expecting that I'm going to increase the size of this database so basically I can I can pay for this database one year up front and I can get discount from the cloud and the last last part is the operate which basically basically um basically constantly improving so it's uh, adding the culture to your company it's um uh, working with your business because business can can come to you and say please do a b c d if we do that it will increase our like uh, infrastructure cost several times maybe let's do it right it's like a constant working with with what you have and then you're repeating the, the, the whole the whole cycle you're going back to inform and so on and so on then again to optimize and you're doing that now how to do that let's go to the next slide how to do that in order to do that there are two approaches like uh, we can call them reactive or proactive. Like um, uh, uh, a reactive approach is basically you're doing something only when it happens. I will give you an example. Usually, usually big companies are doing that in a way that they're doing the monthly or quarterly reviews of the infrastructure. So basically, it could be a dedicated team or it could be like just engineers from a, from an IT department. And they're doing the review of what they have on the infrastructure side once per month or once per quarter. They're taking a look on everything. They're taking a look, look on, the, on, the, on the cost spending. They're taking a look on the sizes of their resources. They're discussing it. And they, they can go back to, to the product owners and they can talk about let's optimize it, let's change it. And which is more important, they're producing reports and those reports goes to the to the uh, go to a different place, could go to the product managers, to, to go to the financial department or to CICTO of the companies. This is the first approach. And, and this approach uh, is good. It's like a first baby step to FinOps. Uh, when you already do the reviews, and as I mentioned to you, in order to achieve it, you need to collect metrics, you need to, to have a text, you need to have a set of tools in order to do that. That's the first part. And the second part is, is more advanced, instead, which I called the, the proactive. Like instead of, instead of waiting till the end of the month, getting the new, new uh, bill from the cloud and then figuring out where did I spend it? What can I do with that? Maybe we can optimize it for the next month. So instead of that, doing everything one step ahead of time. How to do that is basically implementing the FinOps culture within the company and implementing FinOps inside your CI CD approach. I will give you an example. Andre, can you can you uh, go to the next slide? Uh, no, no, no. Hold on. Well, go back, please. Yeah. Well, I will. I will. Then at the end, we'll talk about that. Um, the approach which I'm talking, the proactive approach, is is when before doing any change, you're already thinking about how much it will affect my, my, uh, my costs. And also you're not even thinking, you already automated that, that the tools can say to you that the change, the change will affect this, this, and this. I will give you an example. At the end of the presentation, I have a slide, the screenshot from the, from the Terraform provider, which basically can tell you the difference between between the two states in terms of the pricing. So for example, I'm changing this resource or adding this resource. I'm adding uh, this, I'm, I'm making the Kubernetes cluster larger. I'm going to the serverless, like adding the Lambda, creating a log group. And then the Terraform basically in a plan can say to you that, hey, you know what? 
this is the amount of money that you will start paying. It will be plus like $1,000 a month, or it will be $1,000 less than you was paying before. So you're getting the feedback right away. Um, not, not like waiting till the end of the month and then doing the review. This is the another approach. And I will talk about that a little bit more in depth. Andre, can you go to the next slide? The next, the next what I want to talk uh, um, about is basically what to do when business is coming to you and saying, hey guys, we're spending too much. Let's let's optimize it somehow. How to how to approach the situation? And before approaching the situation, you need to think about the complexity and impact. So I will give you, I will give an example. Like you have a you have a snapshot and it's a very old snapshot, and you're paying for that snapshot on AWS Cloud, like for example, $100 per month. So for you to remove the snapshot, it's like a couple of seconds. Remove the snapshot and bam, you are saving $100 per month. It's very easy. So complexity is low, impact is low, but it's easy to, for you to do. And next, for example, you have, uh, you have uh, a production system and you have very, uh, very large instances or very large uh, clusters, so very large RDS database. And for example, you find out that you are not using, you're not utilizing this database for 100%. You're using only half of that. So you need to right size it. But the complexity is very high. The impact is like, um, okay, okay-ish, uh, but the complexity is too high. Why too high? You will need to schedule that. You will need to test that. You will need to, uh, you will need probably to have a downtime on your production. So it's a high complexity. And this is what you need to consider. On a slide, you see um, uh, uh, AWS recommendations. So basically AWS is saying that here is the impact and complexity based on, based on what we see. And they're saying that going to like um, reservation, reserved instances, savings plans, or doing the uh, different enterprise programs, or removing the idle resources, this, is, this could give you a pretty decent impact with the low complexity. Easy to do, easy to implement, and you will get the benefits right away. Like scheduling, which is, which is shutting down your resources. Resources is more complicated and has a very big impact on the pricing. But again, you can, you can achieve it. Going to the spots, serverless, doing the auto scaling, auto scaling and, and et cetera, base, and same as right sizing has a big complexity and has a big impact. Like, of course you can convert everything to spots. Of course you can go to your functions, serverless, and you will reduce your costs, but it will affect your architecture and you will probably need, the, uh, you will need to do the development and so on and so on. And immigration process will take, will take, uh, will take part. So complexity is high and impact is high. And, and this is how you're approaching the situation. Like you check out the, the complexity, you figured out the impact that, for example, if I will do that, I will save this amount of money. And then you can discuss it with the business that, okay, guys, if we will do this, it will take a couple of months, but we will save 10% of our bill. And, and for example, it's, it's not worth to do that because we can do a bunch of the small things uh, like in one day and we can save the same amount of, of, of money. So this is one of the ways to do that. And of course you cannot do that without again, first of all, getting the metrics, getting the more information about your spending and about your infrastructure. That's why I was talking about the previous, previous things. Let's move to the next slide. And this is what I was talking. Um, this is an example from Terraform. Some of you using the Terraform in order to create the infrastructure on the clouds. And you know that when you're running the Terraform, Terraform is basically showing you the difference, the difference between what you have right now and what's going to be implemented. But it's a difference in terms of the configuration and a difference in terms of the actual resources. Uh, with the additional plugins, with additional providers, you can achieve, achieve um, uh, the difference from the cost perspective. And then you have, a, you have a totally different approach. You can implement a culture within the company that you can 
you can, for example, create a process that on each and every uh, Terraform execution, first of all, the, the cost change plan is created and then someone need to approve it, first of all. Like someone need to take a look on that and say, okay, for this project, we are fine if the cost will be increased 26% or 25%, or we're not okay. You can, you should, you should, you should use like another approach. But also there is a totally different approach. Instead of like, like checking out how, how your infrastructure will be, will be changed, you can do a little bit like an old fashioned way. You can say that, for example, the, the budget for this project or for this for this uh, team is this amount of money. Like for example, the project A should, shouldn't cost us from infrastructure perspective more than like $10,000 per month. And then it's team's responsibility uh, to figure out how to fit within this, this amount of, uh, of money, uh, which again, again, different approach, but they can, they should use the same tools and same metrics in order to figure out how to, how to fit within this this amount of money. So this is the different different approaches. Um, and basically, basically that's it from my side. Uh, Andre, next slide, please. Yeah. So basically, that's it from my side. As I mentioned to you, from a FinOps perspective, um, the first important thing you need to start collecting data about your financial part. So you need to add a tax, you need to uh, create and add a bunch of different tools, you need to, uh, you need to start collecting data. Once you have a data, the next, the next step would be to start doing the optimizations. Having the data, you will be able to do that. And the third part would be start implementing the culture, start implementing the automation when people cannot do uh, whatever they want when they are considering the price of what they are doing. And then you're repeating everything from scratch and going over and over. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. It was really, really great and informative. So thank you for deeping dive into the technological part of the question and the business part of the question. What I'm reading from uh, public sources like social media, on blogs, what people say about FinOps, it's like a part, partly joke, partly not, that first, big companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, were driving the uh, uh, public cloud to be, to, to be, to be purchased, to be uh, bought, yeah? And now they're driving, okay, now you have enough of the public cloud in your company, now you should think about how to optimize. So think about the optimization. So first push was buy, now optimize. You always want like, can you do it together? We buy and we learn how to optimize. So this is like, I mean, it's a chicken and egg question always and, and question of the business, of course, but nevertheless, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's uh, say thank you to Anton for sharing his experience, but we have even more experience guys on this, event, and I'm happy to uh, invite uh, Stanislav, Sergei, and Anton for our conversation about the FinOps. And please be free to ask any question in our chat window or in a Q&A session in your Zoom application. So guys, please unmute yourself. And Anton, I actually have the first question to you so you can summarize what you've just said about the balancing cloud, um, about balancing the business goals and cloud costs. Can you start our conversation answering the questions, summing up your presentation, why FinOps is important? <laughs> Very interesting question. Thank you. Uh... Like on, on one of our previous conferences, uh, Sergey said a very important thing is that FinOps is not about um, about uh, reducing the costs. It's it's about uh, about getting more costs, more more money. It's about more getting more money. Earning, like earning for the business. Right? Earning more money. Yeah, exactly. Like think about that. Uh, if I'm running some application and I'm paying some amount of money 
money for infrastructure in order to run this application. If I will reduce the amount of money that I am paying for infrastructure, this the this amount of money that I reduce, that's money that I earn, that actually my project earn or my, my application earn. So not always I need to bring more customers within my application. Sometimes I just need to reduce the costs. And that's yeah, that's mm -hmm. what about. It's about reducing cost. Optim uh, by the way, very interesting thing. When you start thinking about, about like reducing the costs, uh, and uh, it's it's totally different uh, different uh, mindset. Uh, I I will give you an example. Like um, someone is coming to you, or like a product owner is coming to you and saying that, hey guys, we need to do some kind of uh, cron jobs. We need to run something per schedule. Like we I don't know, we do it something. We're analyzing some some kind of XML files or calling some API, whatever doesn't matter. And and we need to do that. And like. If you already have a Kubernetes cluster, you can say you can you can think about okay, I will do that within the Kubernetes cluster. But if you start thinking about uh, oh, I can do it on top of EC2 instance on top of the server. But once you start thinking about the cost, you start thinking okay, maybe there are alternatives. Maybe I can do it with the with the some functions which will be less costly than if I will do it within within the instance of Kubernetes cluster. And so on, so on. So it's a totally different mindset, which affects even the architecture. Uh, and it's interesting. Very but, well I, said. I, I need, hmm? but I need to do uh, another example here is that uh, it's like in real life. You're trying to, you're trying to, um, like people are saying, in order to be financially independent, you need to st uh, stop spending a lot of money and you need to start saving money, right? But like you can go extreme. You can only drink water and eat bread, and that's it. And then you can save all other money, and you can you can live outside without the home. <laughs> but this that's is not true. the way you that's, want to do that. That's true, right? Yeah, Stas, uh, you are the most experienced among us and long time in the industry and in the role. So, what is your perspective on why FinOps is important? And I do remember your short comment about the recession and the connection to the FinOps as a method. <laughs> so why FinOps is important from your perspective? <clears throat> Hi, guys. Uh, as for me, FinOps, uh, uh, FinOps uh, framework uh, can help you to reduce cost, uh, to control your cost, and planning uh, uh, your money, planning your infrastructure. Uh, how much money you need on the next year, for example, uh, for your department, uh, for company, uh, for infrastructure. It is a first issue. Uh, currently, we have an economical crisis, and uh, we should save cost uh, for our, our cloud infrastructure. I had a lot of cases uh, when I did uh, discovery phases, assessment on clients, and I have found a lot of unused uh, resources. But uh, customers paid for the And so many. Uh, maybe, Sergei, uh, uh, do you have any ideas or experience from uh, uh, your project? Our project, we have a um, really difficult people with whom we need to communicate and to explain some new solution, some new design of our application. We need to uh, create presentation with slides, with pictures, just for proof our new solution. So in this case, you know, helpful tool for us because we can show our customer why we need to use this solution, why we need to improve our uh, EC2 instance size from one size to another size. And it is good to show how much we spend for now and how much we can spend if we change our solution. Very great summary. Thank you, Sergey. Um, Stas, uh, you wanted to add something? Uh, or you are listening to my question? 
No, I have questions uh, to guys. Uh, uh, guys, uh, we, we are working with the DevOps methodology. Uh, we improving uh, uh, DevOps in, uh, <clears throat> in the projects. But uh, uh, should we um, uh, have to compare it to DevOps and FinOps and how to FinOps can help uh, for DevOps? I can I can answer on that or at least try to answer on that. Like <laughs> it's it's similar in some way. Why it's similar? Like DevOps is a culture, but we have the DevOps engineers. And FinOps is a culture, and now we have FinOps engineers. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is this great. Is, this is, but this is the reality. This is the reality. Um uh, actually FinOps is a, is a culture as well as DevOps. Uh, is a culture and you need to build this culture within your company but sometimes instead of building building culture you can basically build a team which will be responsible for this for this culture same applies to finops and both um, cultures are basically saying that you need to automate things you need to do less manually you need to collect more metrics more data and need to create a circle circle you need to create a process basically Anton, yeah, great. Uh, uh, Anton, I need with, um, metrics. Uh, okay, Sergey, go on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, uh, when we talk about FinOps, uh, you should create a metric about uh, your cost metric, how you spend, uh, how much you spend for your uh, users. If you have um, more users in next month, you can predict how much you should spend in this month. We were coming back to the planning planning question, which is uh, critical for uh, any part of the organization, whether it's finance or even IT or uh, DevOps as a direction. I mean, it's important for uh, for everyone. Uh, uh, Anton, you've mentioned uh, the building the team uh, yep. in, the, in, the, in the organization. Well, what to do if the organization company itself is not that big? Yep. It's it's also who is so, responsible? Yeah, who how to organize the process over here? As as I mentioned, like both practices are, are culture. It's like a building a culture. Let's imagine a situation: you are a small startup. You have five developers, and that's it. That's the whole the whole company that you have. Who is responsible for FinOps? Like an old way of thinking. Let's say that the the engineer number one is is responsible for FinOps, but this is the incorrect way to do that more modern and more efficient way to do that that each and everyone is responsible for costs and they need to to consider the cost part each time when they're changing something or doing something and they need to communicate because it's all about the collaboration like you cannot figure out by yourself that i will be using the oracle database but why we need the oracle database if we have the whole company mm -hmm. or out of five engineers Go and speak with other engineers. Maybe you will decide that you need to use another database, which is cheaper, smaller, and more efficient for you. So it's about the collaboration and about shared responsibility. Stas, what about companies you are working with? Are they usually big, small, or mid-sized? <clears throat> what happens uh, over there? In the profit, uh... I'm working with a startup and middle-sized companies, but I, I had big experience uh, working with uh, enterprise and uh, in enterprise, they had FinOps, uh, but in another uh, way, but uh, they had budget uh, for uh, each department. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Anton had this case, I had this uh, case. For example, uh, department has budget uh, $10,000 uh, uh, per month. If you need more, you should argument. You should uh, 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 create ticket, uh, discuss, argument, provide uh, why you need more money, uh, etc. And then, and then you're thinking, okay, I have five microservices. Maybe I will create instead of five, I will create one big, yeah. big application. We'll put it on a couple of the services. We'll be paying less money. That's it. That's also a part of uh, part of the way to do that. I won't, I didn't say that it's correct one, but this is the way to do that. 
Yeah, Anton, uh, I have um, uh, small questions. Uh, you discuss, uh, we discuss at uh, startups, yes, uh, small companies, uh, etc. Share it responsibility, it is okay. But uh, uh, in the most of cases, startup has uh, credits from uh, cloud providers. And uh, uh, they don't think about FinOps. No, they, and they're not, they're not considering uh, credits received from the uh, from the cl uh, clouds as a real money. This is the this this is the reality. So, and it's not only about it's not only about the clouds and credits. It's even in the real life when people are getting some uh, some bonuses or some like virtual money. They're not considering them as a real money because they get it for free, and they're not considering this uh, as a real money. Same on the clouds. People get the credits, especially startups, because there are a lot of different startup programs. And they're starting to spend it without thinking about an infrastructure cost, anything up until they don't have this, this amount of credits. While FinOps says that any money is money, like credits is also money, and you can live on credits and you can you can build your application on top of the infrastructure with the credits. You always need to think about doing it more efficient. And at and uh, with the less cost, guys. Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest in the world, uh, venture funds, Anderson Horowitz, presented the research which says that companies that are doing just AI products uh, in their PNL of the company, spending like twenty five percent of the PNL to the public cloud, which is actually clear, right? If you are doing AI products, you need really resources in order to um, work with the data, with the images, with the video recognition, so on, so on, so forth. The questions, are, this is one of the examples, but the 25% of PNL of the company is pretty big number. What are the other drivers when, which creates the need of, of the FinOps? I got from you the point that it's actually the culture, it's a mindset. You need to do it from the very beginning. But anyway, what are the conditions when company definitely will face with their need to apply or think about the FinOps optimization? So the question is more about right the resources, what they are using, how they are maybe calculated or monetized by the vendors. So what are the drivers that bring the company to think about the FinOps? I have a proposal to start from a, a small example. Anton uh, uh, had an uh, excellent uh, example. For example, uh, he uh, in uh, check it uh, one infrastructure uh, uh, in uh, uh, his customers and uh, they have found uh, uh, snapshots, if I am right, or uh, army Amis, images. Uh, AMIs, yeah, uh, images. Yes, uh, each army images uh, cost uh, two thousand uh, dollars per month, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and and yeah. So the the drivers, it's 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 story about the drivers. That's uh, that's true. Um, like again, let's let's discuss this uh, this this case. So I I actually had a. Uh, had a case with one of the clients. It's a big, big uh, bank, um, and basically uh, they're using cloud, and and they're paying paying a lot of money to cloud, which is fine, which is which is okay, and they were they were not doing the FinOps at all, like no FinOps in, in the in their organization. They were paying okay. They were thinking that everything is okay, but then they started to do the the review of what what they have, where they're paying, where the money goes, and they find out that they have like a bunch of different different the images, which is again, okay. Each and every project has the images. You need to create images because, because this is your templates. This is what you're using. But they found that out of the bench of those images, five of them has a price of $2,000 per month. So five of them uh, is uh, each. So five of them is $10,000 per month just for images. And that was like an eye opening for them. They're like, so okay, if we spending ten thousand dollars just for keeping the images, maybe we're overspending something else somewhere else. And they started to think about that, and and it was very funny to to observe it 
when the CTO of the company said to the whole team that postpone everything that you are doing and like the next week you're reviewing everything. And they started to review everything. And you know what? They get the great results. And then last two months, the price of their like a monthly cost dropped 25%. Oh, really? Yeah, 25%. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. like, it's a, it's a big amount of money. And um, this is the real story. So companies and people usually doesn't do the FinOps up until they notice that they are not spending money in the correct way. Usual it's story. like you are not following the security or don't pay attention to security exactly. until you are happy, yeah. right? Yeah, like a story yeah. with, the, with, with the Uber recently. They they were yeah. hacked and now they are hiring a lot of security engineers. Uh, but uh, also I've had a lot of uh, issues uh, with EBS volume in AWS. For example, when you use uh, uh, EKS cl uh, Kubernetes cluster, for example, you create for testing purpose a uh, Kubernetes cluster, delete Kubernetes cluster, or deploy different uh, applications, uh, stateful applications uh, uh, with uh, persistent volumes. You delete a Kubernetes cluster, but EBS volume uh, still exists uh, and uh, nobody... Uh, take a look on this. Uh, uh, should we delete a persistent volume in EPS or not? But uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, with Sergei, um, we deleted a lot of uh, unused EPS volumes in one uh, in, in one project. So after uh, checking, uh, we were surprised about it. Uh, Sergei. Do you remember this case? Yeah, yeah. we have a, a case that we uh, start to figure out why, what we pay so much. We investigate all of our uh, AWS accounts, try to find how we can reduce our bill. And uh, we find uh, many EBS volumes that are not attached. And I think the, our developers is forgot about these uh, EBS volumes. So we just delete it and it give us uh, cool. Yes, sound issues, but I, I want to add a lot of yeah, them. a lot. Of, I, I will give another example. Uh, it, it just a technical one. one, like if you're using the AWS cloud and you're using the, the lambdas, the serverless, yeah. like you're creating a lambda and la lambda is creating the log group. So where it's keeping the, the logs. And then you decided to stop using lambda. You're removing the lambda, but the logs are still there, right? So like, it, it's a, like a usual story. And you have this log group, which, and you're paying for that, like very easy story. I have a I have a customer who has a thousand of lambdas, and their developers like creating, removing lambda, creating, removing lambda. And the end of the month, they have a huge bill for the for the logs, and they don't need those logs. That's like uh, like usual story. And there are a lot of such uh, such cases. And yeah. someone need to to review it, but basically instead of someone, it should be a process within the company. And uh, uh, you should uh, control your expenses, uh, control your resources every time. It is uh, like GiveOps. Also, uh, GiveOps uh, provide you possibility to deploy uh, uh, very um, easily deploy new environment, delete environment. And uh, now we have a very popular trend to manage your cloud, uh, create uh, cloud resources via uh, Kubernetes. Uh, please imagine these situations. Deploy Kubernetes and after that uh, create resources. If you delete uh, Kubernetes cluster without deleting uh, Kubernetes object, custom resource definition, uh, these resources uh, still exist, but you delete Kubernetes cluster. You should uh, check and control your cloud every day. With example, with after deleting Kubernetes cluster, we still have something like load balancer. They are not deleted automatically when we delete our uh, Kubernetes cluster. So we are paid for them. Three, who then uh, is responsible or who are the team members uh, to control all those things? I mean, we're talking about controlling money, 
controlling who is using what, not to forget. So who are those people in the team? Yeah. Uh, basic principle of FinOp that responsibility replaced to all of our team members. So each of our colleagues is responsible for cloud usage, cloud resource, and uh, this person is responsible for delete after he ends his work, delete a resource that with with a full so person I think this is all team is responsible for uh, cost savings of our business of our project. I see. That's uh, so even in the in the small company, I mean as Anton Anton said. Uh, it's a responsibility of uh, over everyone. Yeah. Yes, a shared responsibility. Nice. But uh, guys, what do you think? Uh, uh, who um, uh, should company has uh, FinOps uh, engineers or uh, company should use uh, automatic tooling, uh, etc.? Good, good question. So uh, I can answer that that question in this way. Right now we are living in a in a like um, before AI world. So we have already AI tools, but they're not like totally automated. They still like require human to double check it, to do that. So basically, basically you cannot rely fully on just tools. You still need a human. You can, you can have a shared responsibility when people are using tools to help them, or you can have a dedicated engineer who is using bunch of, bunch of different tools to, to uh, get the FinOps done. In future, I believe uh, we will have AI, which is doing that instead of Oh us. yeah, we will. And it's already Thank doing, you. it is already doing, that's right. Yeah, yeah, in some way, yes, yeah, yeah. Sergey, as you are fresh uh, and thus also fresh from the, after the uh, certifications, uh, on a, on a FinOps. So what I, I, I'm not saying like what FinOps uh, as a culture is saying in terms of the uh, skills that are required, but what actually are the, what is the expertise is required in order to support FinOps culture or processes in the organization, like to set, to set it up, to support, to control, to monitor and actually uh, working uh, uh, by hands, doing some things. Can you elaborate on them? So how it's how it works? Uh, from what from one side, you need expertise in cloud. Uh, it can be where. That uh, can it can be uh, it can be um, for example use Lambda instead of Kubernetes cluster if we can use it. Mm -hmm. So in general, you need to have good knowledge. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear it. I mean, in uh, having the, so the Sergey is saying about the tech, uh, public cloud skills and that's for uh, for sure, right? For sure, so, yeah. Anton, you're working on the customer projects. Like what, what do you see on the customer side or what do you see which is missing from the skills perspective when you are working or talking about FinOps on the projects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, about the skills. So it's definitely a cloud, but not everyone who knows cloud can do the FinOps. I will give you an example. Like usually engineers, like technical engineers, they're really good with the, with the with technical stuff. So they're good with the cloud, they're good with the programming languages and so on. But FinOps is about analyzing data. So you not only need to know the cloud, but you need to analyze a bunch of different data. And you probably saw such engineers within your company. This is usually like, Engineers who are very easily can go to Kibana, uh, draw a lot of different uh, different diagrams, and then they can figure out what's happening with your logs. Or it's like a people uh, you probably saw, which are experts in Excel files, and they can 
they can create a, a, a big Excel files, they can quickly analyze it and so on. Not everyone can do that, that's, that's true. So it's like cloud experts, but with the skills to do the analysis. Uh, I would say even differently, people who can do the troubleshooting when they uh, like in, in, in a professional way, like they can uh, sit for hours and can do the troubleshooting and they can figure out what's happening and why, and they can use a bunch of different tools. Mm -hmm. If you will add the cloud knowledge to them, they can do the FinOps. So FinOps is here to stay because the cloud is here to stay. So FinOps is here to stay despite it's a young and developing subject, right? Or uh, area of uh, managing the cloud. And it is interesting was for me that FinOps is positioned apart from the financial departments of the companies. Yeah. It's like even planned position, position beside the CIO budget. Why it is so? Yep. Because again, like in a perfect ideal world, um, and, and, and when people are creating the practices or best practices, they're mainly talking about the enterprises, about yeah. the large companies. And when they're talking about the large companies, the, the idea the idea is that someone need to approve the, the some someone need to approve the money, someone need to approve the budget. And that's the people or that's the department who is basically going to do that. They will yes. be going over different departments saying, okay, you are spending money non-efficiently, please do A, B, C, D. This is our practice. This is our rules. Please, please follow it. And that's why they're part of more financial department rather than DevOps or IT department in large companies. But again, startups, they don't have 1,000 employees. They have they only don't. like five, five, 10 engineers. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> so you are... Financial director, your CEO, your CTO, your DevOps, and your FinOps all together. <laughs> it's true. It's true, guys. We are very close to our price draw. Any final words you would like to highlight before we move to our price draw? Because conversation was very, very great. I think we will take some insights, publishing them on our blog and also uh, on our social media. But before we close our panel discussion. Any final closing words you would like to highlight um, for our audience? In my, I, I will start. <laughs> in my opinion, I mean, we should implement FinOps in each project, in each company, because it gives us ability to save our money and also it gives ability to get money for business. So it is really important for a project, for a business to get more money. This is great that you highlighted that because this is what we have started from our conversation. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the business needs to earn money and in order to earn, like you really need this type of, uh, of, a, of a culture. Yeah. Stas, any closing words from your side? No, the same, the same. Mm. Because uh, each pro uh, we should implement at uh, FinOps, uh, we should thinking about reducing cost in each project. Yeah, um, from my po from my perspective, I'm saying this like you save the money in order to reinvest because you use public cloud to do yes, business sure. or to create innovations, and in order to continue doing them to do it continuous innovations, you need to save and then reinvest, and then really the public yes. cloud somehow starts working for you, for your business. Okay, gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for the conversation. Um, I will ask you to stay here because we are going to uh, now price draw our certification voucher. Uh, Sergey, as you are not that long ago obtained the certification, yeah. maybe you can tell a little bit what is it about? So what's in the end of the certification? It is an interesting uh, exam. It uh, has 50 questions and 60 minutes uh, for this exam. Interesting thing of this exam is that you can come back and verify your answers. So you should answer from first time. Also, you have uh, three uh, retakes if you, for example, 
and finally performed the third and second try. So, Stas, uh, do you remember you sh you can return back or not? Because we didn't hear Sergey very well. Yeah. Uh, you, you can. Okay, great. Okay, so what I'm doing now, uh, I will share my screen where I have put all the registered attendees. Hope. All the registered attendees into my wonderful picker wheel. Uh, tell me, please, if you see my screen and picker wheel. Guys, do you see it? Yes. Ah, good, good. Oh, let me share, by the way, with uh, with the sound. Share sound, okay. Okay, here it is. Uh, so we will, I will, um, I will turn the picker wheel. Uh, we, of course, it's, uh, I think it's more or less clear that we will select the winner um, among those who is here. So we have one voucher, so, and I wish you luck. What else? So we are spinning. And who will be the winner? The winner, if you will be here, please chat in the chat window that you are here. So it's Chan Beller. So if you are here, give uh, any type of sign to our chat window. If not, we will continue actually. So it can be, can be longer. I think I didn't see in the list. No, I didn't. Okay, then let's uh, move on. The next one. Okay, his name was uh, on the registration form. So let me know if we... I think we have. I think, yeah. I yeah, think it's, it's Mustafa, if I'm not mistaken. Mustafa, let us know uh, in a chat window if it is uh, actually you. Okay, I see. Uh, Uh, people say the chat is disabled. Oh. oh, okay. The chat is disabled. Okay. I will promote Mustafa. Mustafa, if you can just give us a voice that is you, you're here. I see that you're here. I have allowed you to speak. Anyway, we, um, we have a winner. Uh, and we will contact you by email that you have left during the registration. Uh, so congratulations, it's uh, great. Uh, so we, we will reach out to you by email and organize uh, organize our, yeah, and organize the delivery of a digital voucher. Great. So gentlemen, Thank you very much for a great conversation. Uh, thank you very much all the attendees for being with us today and spending this uh, hour and 20 minutes talking and listening about the uh, FinOps. It was really great pleasure. Can't wait to see you again. Uh, and please be aware that you will get the email with the link to the YouTube uh, where this recording will be placed. Also, uh, it, you will get the email with the uh, access to other recordings and other webinars that we have delivered. Have a great rest of the evening. Goodbye and take care.